Oral questions. Question orale, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, in May, this government signed with Chinese pharmaceutical giant Canso, CanSino to manufacture a COVID-19 vaccine. In late August, the deal fell apart. It wasn't until September 16th that this government opened up a new approval stream for COVID-19 vaccines that could be imported to Canada. The first approvals weren't applied for until October. Mr. Speaker, why did this Prime Minister cost Canadians five months in the vaccine race because he wanted to partner with China? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, from the spring, we knew that the way through this pandemic was going to be with vaccines. So we set out uh, to, organize, to make deals and to find out uh, how many vaccine companies we could uh, sign potential deals with. We actually signed uh, and announced deals uh, with Moderna and Pfizer in early August, well before uh, the uh, CanSino project uh, fell through. We put all our eggs in as many different baskets as possible, and that's how we have the most diverse portfolio portfolio of vaccines and more doses potentially per capita than any other country in the world. We've been there for Canadians. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister partnered with CanSino first in May, and we know from Global News today that CSIS had been warning this government about CanSino for years. In fact, we asked the Public Safety Minister last week if intelligence officials had briefed the Prime Minister and the government about risks on CanSino. He refused to answer, Mr. Speaker, and Canadians deserve answers. How delayed is our vaccine response going to be because this Prime Minister preferred to partner with China ahead of everyone else? Yeah. Yeah. Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the answer is not at all, not delayed at all, because we set out to uh, make sure we were knocking on every single door. We were ensuring uh, that regardless of which companies or which researchers found the vaccine first, Canadians would get uh, doses of those vaccines. And that's how we ended up with the broadest portfolio of potential vaccines of most countries in the world and more doses per capita than just about any other country. We have been there with a solid plan to ensure that Canadians get vaccinated when the time comes. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Quote, what China did is they got what they needed from Canada and they stopped the vaccine shipment. This neutralizes the ability for Canada to participate in developing the vaccine. End quote. This is the assessment of a leading intelligence expert on how the Liberal government got played by China. Why did this government bet our nation's health, our economy, on a partnership that it was told was against our national security interest? The right Honourable Prime Minister. Once again, the Conservative Party is just making things up. We actually secured the broadest range of vaccine potentials. We knocked on every door to make sure that Canadians would maximize their chances of getting an effective vaccine when they came through. Yes, when CanSino uh, withdrew, uh, we went from potentially eight deals with vaccine makers to seven deals with vaccine makers. But those seven deals that we have cover the best portfolio of any country in the world and more doses per Canadian per citizen than just about any other country. That's the leadership we've shown. That's how we have Canadians back. I just want to remind the honourable members that the way it works is when you're named, you ask the questions not while the person is answering. That, that just doesn't work in the in the chamber. And I'm sure it'll cause a lot of distractions. Well it is causing a lot of distractions. I just wanted to point out to those who forgot the rules. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, between April and June, France will vaccinate its entire population. In the U.S., the country will be vaccinated by June as well. In Canada, our Liberal government says some Canadians will be vaccinated by September. How will Canadians feel when the U.S. economy reopens, but we have to stay locked down. Why the delay? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Health Canada is currently studying four different vaccines. 
on an accelerated, in an accelerated fashion. We have secured millions of doses of vaccines for Canadians. We are looking after the safety of them. We are ensuring Canadians that these vaccines will be safe. At the same time, we have guarantees for doses for Canadians. We will weather this pandemic together. We will come out on the other side thanks to everything that we've done together. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, this week, the Vice Deputy Prime Minister tabled her economic statement. And all it is is rhetoric. There's no plan for rapid testing and vaccinations. No. No economic recovery. The Liberal government is afraid to make vaccines a priority for Canadians. Quebecers are concerned because it's almost Christmas. It's time to give them some hope. When will the government put forth a plan to give this country some hope? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. The Conservatives want to talk about a plan. Well, here's a plan. We are protecting the health of Canadians with the economic statement. We are ensuring that all Canadians have access to a vaccine that is safe and effective as well as free. The plan will enable our economy to come back strong with measures for those sectors that have been the hardest to hit. We will put in place a better situation for all Canadians. We remember what uh, the Conservatives did when they uh, went into uh, an austere planning phase in 2008. We have a better plan for Canadians. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. The Canadian Constitution is very clear and has stated that health is a, an exclusive provincial jurisdiction. In 77, the Fed the federal government uh, paid 50 percent of health uh, costs, and it went down, and it's continued to decrease. My question is this, because uh, the provinces and Quebec need predictability in order to monitor the crisis and to deal with it, will the Prime Minister defy the Constitution and not do what the provinces need? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Canadians are proud of the health care system and expect us to work together to improve it. We have uh, paid $19 billion to the provinces to, to relaunch the economy while responding to uh, the pandemic. $11 billion to help the provinces and territories to improve access uh, to home care, mental health services, among other things. $200 billion over the next five years in the health care system for the provinces and territories. We will always work together to protect the health and safety of all Canadians. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. It fascinates me that there are written answers to questions that haven't been asked yet. But if we look at the Constitution, because, uh, well, you know, I've got some ideas for the Constitution I can share with them. How can he say that everything's going so well when he's just received the results of a unanimous vote in the National Assembly where they've said for long-term care facilities, stick to your own business, mind your bus own business. Will he continue to show contempt for his obligations towards Quebec and the provinces? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, since the start of the pandemic, we have been working hand in hand to, with the provinces and territories for Canadians. We have provided direct assistance to Canadians through the CERB, funding for businesses, the wage subsidy. We're going to continue to transfer money in addition to help with the provinces and territories with additional costs for the health care system for the school system, for their additional costs. We know that we have to work together while we always respect areas of jurisdiction. We will continue to work together to help Canadians and to build a better future. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Australia published a plan for rolling out their vaccinations on the, a website. The UK has just approved a vaccine that will be rolled out in the next few weeks. But in Canada, we still don't have a plan to vaccinate Canadians 
against COVID-19. Canadians deserve to know what the plan is. When will we have vaccines? Who will receive them? What is the plan for the COVID-19 vaccine rollout? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Since the spring, we have been working with the provinces and territories to deliver vaccines across the country. We worked with the armed forces and experts in immuno immunology to have put forth the lists, and we are going to continue working with the provinces and territories to deliver those vaccines, as we do every year. Canadians deliver vaccines every year. 19 million people have been vaccinated against the flu. This is a big challenge, but we are capable to rise to that challenge, and we will do so. The Liberal government has just acknowledged that they will break a commitment to the Indigenous people for clean drinking water. Now, I want this Prime Minister to hear what this means from a nine-year-old girl named B. Munias from the Nistanga Nation who will not be able to go home. She says, sometimes I feel like we don't exist, like nobody knows that we have no clean water. Like we're just ghosts and we're just put in a drawer in a box. Could the Prime Minister look B. Muniaz in her eyes and say why this country has not provided clean drinking water? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, my thought. I'll stop the Right Honourable Prime Minister. Uh, someone has their microphone on at home. I want to make sure that everyone has their microphones on mute. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have been working closely with communities right across the country, including Nishkandiga uh, and its citizens, to ensure uh, that we're giving them all the support they need through this pandemic. In terms of drinking water, decades of neglect led to the unacceptable reality of First Nations on reserve not having access to safe, clean, reliable drinking water. We remain aggressively committed to lifting all long-term advisories and ensuring First Nations can have clean water now and into the future. The FES provided an additional $1.5 billion to accelerate this commitment. We will continue to work in partnership with First Nations to get it done. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Nose Hill. There will be three ways of vaccinating people hospitals, vaccination centres and in the community with GPs and pharmacists. Around 50 hospitals are on standby and vaccination centres in venues such as conference centres or sports stadiums are being set up now. This is with regard to a vaccine that's being, a COVID vaccine that's being released to the public tomorrow. I wish we could say that here in Canada. Instead, we have to congratulate our friends in the United Kingdom for getting their act together. So the question is this. When will the Prime Minister give that exact same information to Canadians? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, every step of the way, we have relied on experts and scientists to give us uh, recommendations on how to move forward on a rollout of vaccines right across the country. We've worked closely with the provinces and territories, and we will continue. We put uh, the Canadian Armed Forces Major General, Danny Fortin, in charge of the logistics of rolling out and coordinating with uh, the provinces and territories on vaccines. Right now, as we speak, Health Canada is looking at four different vaccine candidates. Uh, candidates that are leading around the world and that we have signed for tens of millions of doses for. Canadians will be covered on vaccines. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Nose Hill. Just moments ago on CJOB in Manitoba, Manitoba's Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Rusin, came out and said that Manitoba's vaccine supply will be very limited in the early months of next year. That's in direct contradiction to what the Prime Minister just said. Meanwhile, we're hearing that New York State is going to have 170,000 doses for deployment on December 15th. Does the Prime Minister realize that he is going to have to update his talking point binder and give Canadians some information Absolutely. on when they're getting that vaccine and where, as opposed to just spouting nonsense about his failure to plan? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. 
Speaker, allow me to begin by again uh, telling the people of Manitoba and their public health officer that as a federal government, we will continue to be there to support them while they go through this difficult time. We are there to support uh, Manitoba like we are there to support premiers right across the country who are facing a rise in cases. Uh, part of that is making sure we're able to deliver on the tens of millions of vaccine doses that we have secured because we have access to the largest range of vaccines uh, of just about any other country in the world because we did the work early on in securing doses for Canadians so we can all get through this pandemic together. Absolutely. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, today we learned that uh, scientists from CanSino who were trained in Canada were also working for information gathering networks for the Chinese Communist Party. The co-founders of CanSino were part of the program to transfer knowledge and research results from Canada to China. We know that CanSino never intended to honor the agreement, and worse, our Canadian intellectual property is now in the hands of the Chinese government. The Prime Minister signed the, the agreement with CanSino knowing these facts. Why? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, several years ago, the partnership with CanSino helped us uh, to fight Ebola. It had a significant a positive impact. We considered CanSino among the other vaccine candidates. As part of the negotiations and discussions, we talked about various vaccine candidates, and that's why today we have the best portfolio of possible vaccines in the world, and more potential doses per capita than any other country in the world. The Honourable Member. That's a ridiculous answer, Mr. Speaker. Today we're talking about CanSino, and their CEO and executive director has been identified as one of the uh, China's talent plan, and they served as informants. Intellectual property information has been leaked to, to China. This has uh, a serious risk for Canada and for our security. Why is the Prime Minister so uh, keen to work with the Chinese regime? The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, my responsibility as Prime Minister is to oversee the security and safety of Canadians and their health. That is what I have always done and will continue to do, and I will work with whoever can help us ensure Canadians are safe. The Conservatives are saying that, well, they wouldn't have worked with China. Well, that's their choice. But we are ensuring that we have access to more vaccines per capita than any other country. and. We wanted to uh, enter into partnerships with many in order to keep Canadians safe. While they're focusing on politics and ideology, we're working for Canadians. The member for Selkirk Interlake Eastman. Mr. Speaker, Canadians trust our Canadian Armed Forces to get the job done, but nobody trusts this Liberal government. Instead of hiding their vaccine plan behind a veil of secrecy, perhaps the Prime Minister can answer some very basic questions. Canadians deserve to know exactly how our military is going to be used. How many troops have been placed on high readiness? How many military aircraft will be deployed to deliver vaccines? When will vaccines be delivered by our troops to communities in the remote and northern areas? Can the Prime Minister simply give us some dates, numbers, timelines, anything? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, from the beginning, Canadians have a simple question. When is this pandemic going to be over? When do we get back to go to our lives? When do we get through this? Well, the answer, Mr. Speaker, is uh, we get through this uh, with vaccines, and we're working to do it as quickly as possible. That's why we secured uh, access to more vaccines per person than just about any other country in the world from a large range of potential vaccine makers because we, we didn't have, there isn't a vaccine against COVID-19 until very recently. We are going to ensure that we have uh, vaccines for Canadians, and we're counting on the armed forces to help. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, last night on a call with MPs, Dr. New su suggested the spoilage rate for the Pfizer vaccine would be as high as 5 per cent. That's critical information that this government has kept hidden from Canadians. We don't know when the vaccine is arriving. 
We don't know how it's being distributed, and we don't know which Canadians are going to receive it first. And the Minister of Health is laughing at these questions today, Mr. Speaker. If the Prime Minister thinks we're all in this together, why does he refuse to publish a plan so that we can all be in this together? The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, from the beginning of this pandemic, we have worked closely with scientists, with experts on everything from prioritization of certain populations for receiving vaccines uh, to delivering uh, the kinds of support uh, across communities that are necessary. We have worked with provinces and territories, with municipalities, with all Canadians in terms of getting through this pandemic, and we will continue to. Every step of the way, whether it's with the Canadian Armed Forces, with its Red Cross, with its researchers and scientists from across the country. Canadians have pulled together to ensure that we get through this pandemic, and that's exactly what we're going to do together. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have the impression that uh, the Prime Minister may or may not have uh, seen the reaction of the Quebec National Assembly. Now, he keeps talking about uh, working hand in hand, and I find that worrisome. Now, we've established very clearly that the federal government has obligations to the provinces, to Quebec, but the government is not respecting its own obligations. How can it want to impose obligations on others, that being the case? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, for the Bloc Québécois, picking a fight with the... Uh, with Ottawa is their raison d'être. We are working with Quebec, however. We are working hand in hand with Quebec to protect our seniors, as we did when the Canadian forces helped out with the Red Cross. We've always ensured that the resources are there to weather this crisis. They've received their share of the $25 billion that we sent it to the provinces to help them get through the crisis. We are going to continue to work uh, with the provinces and Quebec to help seniors, families, and all Canadians. The Honourable Member. Does it bother the Prime Minister if I tell Quebecers, Quebecers that, in his vision, Quebecers are branches of Ottawa, that there is no Quebec nation, that there is no exclusive jurisdiction, that there isn't respect for the Quebec National Assembly, for the Quebec government, nor is there respect for Quebec. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, that is the bloc's perspective. We're in a pandemic. People are working together. We're fighting day in and day out against the virus. We're working to deliver PPE rapid testing, vaccinations. We're working together, but the Bloc doesn't want to talk about the fact that the federal government is present to concretely help Quebecers on the ground. And it's uh, trying to pick a fight. We're not squabbling, Mr. Speaker. We're working for all Canadians. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Island and Rideau Lakes. Mr. Speaker, we know the Prime Minister's usual reaction when the RCMP come calling with questions about his corruption or ethical breaches of his Liberal colleagues. He rips the phone out of the wall and locks the door, blocking them at every step. But last week we heard from the lobbying commissioner that there are three illegal lobbying inquiries sent to the RCMP since the start of this pandemic. Is the Prime Minister aware of any recent or ongoing inquiries by the RCMP into him? Liberal staff or Liberal members? Yeah. Honourable Prime Minister. Once again, in their characterizations, Conservatives continue to just make things up. But I can answer directly on that question that we are unaware of any such investigations. And a reminder to our colleagues that the lobbying commissioner does not investigate public office holders.
The Honourable Member for Leeds, Granville, Thousand Islands and Rita Lakes. Well, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister doesn't need to take my word for it. Conservatives aren't making up. It's the lobbying commissioner who has said that there are RCMP investigations into illegal lobbying by this government. It's clear that they play fast and loose with the ethical and lobbying rules, and they're being investigated. This Prime Minister is being investigated for a third time. Will the Prime Minister commit to fully cooperating with investigations by officers of Parliament and the RCMP. Will he commit to waiving cabinet confidence? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Again, Mr. Speaker, I and my office are entirely unaware of any such investigations. And a reminder that the lobbying commissioner does not look into the actions of public office holders. The Honourable Member for Lakeland. Mr. Speaker, hostile foreign state agents are operating in Canada. Iran is bypassing international sanctions by using small currency exchanges in Canada to wire money. Global News has a CSIS report that states that an Iranian expat is, quote, assisting the government of Iran with clandestine wiring of monies into Canada. Iran's banks fund terrorist groups like Hamas and Hezbollah, then the banks are being used by Iran for foreign interference here in Canada. So. When will the Prime Minister take this seriously, and when will they arrest and deport state hostile foreign agents in Canada? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canadian intelligence services and agencies take very seriously the, uh, the uh, allegations and information around uh, interference or uh, uh, misuse of, uh, of uh, public trust uh, by foreign actors. We will continue to ensure that they have all the tools necessary to keep Canadians safe. Uh, to protect our democracy and continue uh, to uphold the values that we all hold dear in this country. The Honourable Member for Lakeland. Well, the intelligence officers take this threat very seriously, but the Prime Minister doesn't. We asked the Public Safety Minister about this last week, and he sidestepped answering about the connections that the member from, Rich mem member from Richmond Hill has to that individual. The member accepted political donations from them, hosted them on, on a tour of Parliament. He even took a photo with the guy in your chair, Mr. Speaker. The PMO refused to answer any questions about this connection, including from journalists. So I'll ask, is he passive against foreign state hostile agents in Canada because he has a politically exposed person in his own caucus. Wow. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the member in question has addressed this issue. The Honourable Member for Hamilton Mountain. Mr. Speaker, this week's fiscal update proves once again that the Liberal government can't keep their promises and don't care about working people only making minimum wage. After la laughing off the federal minimum wage just a few years ago, the Liberals promised it the last election. And now they're laughing again because the promise was a joke. Why don't Liberals think the Canadians working full-time jobs should be able to put food on the table and pay their bills? When will this Prime Minister deliver on his $15 an hour minimum wage he promised Canadians? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our priority in this FES and in all the actions we take is to help Canadians through this pandemic. We know that the best way through, not just for Canadians' health, but for our economy as well, is to make the necessary investments to support workers, small businesses, families, seniors, to help Canadians get through this pandemic. That's exactly what we laid out in this FES. Uh, this is exactly what we will continue to do to support Canadians every step of the way. We are there for the middle class and people working hard to join it. We will continue to be. The Honourable Member for London, Fanshawe. Monday, the Liberals announced they were going back on their word, cancelling the moratorium on student loan payments and forcing students to make loan payments again despite record high COVID cases across the country. Mr. Speaker, a pause on interest is very different than a moratorium on payments. But yesterday, the Minister for Women and Gender Equality tweeted to tell students the moratorium was extended. Will the Minister apologize for spreading misinformation, or better yet, will the Liberals change the policy to help students and make what their Minister is saying actually true? 
Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, this government has supported students every step of the way. We paused Canada student loan repayments. We doubled Canada student grants. We introduced the Canada Emergency Student Benefit, which provided support to more than 700,000 post-secondary students and recent graduates. In the fall economic statement, we announced we will eliminate the interest on Canada student loans and on Canada apprentice loans for a full year and support more opportunities through the Youth Employment and Skills Strategy and Canada Summer Jobs. The message to Canadians is clear. We will have students' backs. The Honourable Member for Acadie Bathurst. Mr. Speaker, we know that this pandemic has been particularly difficult for children and young families. With school and child care closures and workplace closures, many families have had to make difficult choices. Our government has promised to continue helping Canadian families. Can the Prime Minister tell us how the fall economic update will assist families with young children, both in Acadie Bathurst and throughout the country? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. I'd like to thank the member for Acadie Bathurst for his excellent question and his excellent work. We know that many middle-class families are having trouble making ends meet, especially during the pandemic. That is why we have announced additional assistance of up to $1,200 in 2021 for low- and middle-income families that are eligible for the, the Canada Child Benefit for each children under six years old. Our government has been there for Canadians since the beginning of this pandemic, and we will continue to be there. Swick Southwest. Good news! The Liberals say the government's high-speed internet service maps filled with bad data can be corrected. Bad news! The onus is on municipalities to fix the errors. Rural communities have 75 days to convince Ottawa that service maps are wrong or else lose federal assistance. Now, the minister responsible for this program gave herself a six-month extension before rolling it out. But small communities around Miramichi, places like Blackville, St. Margaret's, Bay St. Anne, have only 75 days to fix this problem. Why does the minister expect rural Canadians to find and correct mistakes made by this Liberal government? Yeah. Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Thank you. As we continue to deal with this COVID-19 pandemic, Canadians have needed to rely on the internet to help connect them to work, school, government resources and loved ones. That's why we announced an investment of $1.75 billion to help connect Canadians to high-speed internet across the country, grow businesses and create jobs. This investment will connect 98% of Canadians to high-speed internet by 2026 with the goal of connecting connecting all Canadians a few years later. It is the largest one-time federal investment in rural broadband, ten times as much in five years as Conservatives did in ten years. We are there for rural Canadians. We are there for all Canadians. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, rural broadband is necessary if you want small businesses to survive during lockdowns. But the government's service maps in Atlantic Canada leave a lot of communities without the ability of funding assistance to expand this essential service. Communities in Cumberland, Colchester, in Caledonia, in North Queens, Nova Scotia, they're being made to fix the mistakes done by this government, Mr. Speaker. Why are small rural communities across Atlantic Canada getting nothing but a dial tone from this Prime Minister? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, let us look at the record of supporting rural Canadians with internet. Over the past five years, we have invested ten times more than the Conservatives invested in ten years in government, in supporting rural Canadians, in getting internet to them. We will continue to work on accelerating those investments because we know rural Canadians and indeed all Canadians deserve to be connected and that's what this government is doing. The Honourable Member for Cypress Hills Grasslands. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, this government refuses to hear the voices of Canadians with disabilities and ignores the input of physicians. A growing list of doctors from every province provided a strong statement with over 1,000 signatures to the study of Bill C-7. So I was shocked when I learned the following. Medical assistance in dying has been deemed an essential service under the Canada Health Act, but yet palliative care has not. Does the Prime Minister recognize that this is a big problem? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. 
Speaker, medical assistance in dying is a difficult, complex and deeply personal issue. We reintroduced legislation that we believe strikes the right balance between upholding rights and protecting our most vulnerable. We've done so by listening to the diverse and evolving views of Canadians on this issue. That's exactly what we will continue to do as we move forward to meet the court-imposed deadline. We hope all parties in this House will work with us to do this difficult but critically important work. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, C7 doesn't strike the right balance, and in fact, those diverse voices the Prime Minister has been talking about have said that. Disability groups, Indigenous advocates, physicians. In fact, the Prime Minister can just ask his Minister of Employment. Last week, she told the Senate she agreed with the concerns being advocated by disability advocates, Conservative MPs, and many other Canadians for weeks. So I want to thank the government for providing more time for us to speak on this issue. But I want the Prime Minister to heed the advice of so many Canadians. Let's make the changes to protect the most vulnerable in medical assistance yes. in dying. Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, this House has worked over many years now to move forward on getting that balance right between protecting the most vulnerable and respecting people's fundamental rights. The approach is meant to ensure people who are suffering unbearable pain have the choice of a peaceful death. The proposed legislation contains revised safeguards to protect vulnerable persons from pressure and coercion and to ensure that medical assistance in dying is always an informed and voluntary choice. It is a difficult balance to strike, but it is one that Canadians expect us to do the work on, and that's exactly what we are doing. Honourable député de Saint-Hyacinthe. The Honourable Member for Saint-Hyacinthe, Bagot. Mr. Speaker, yesterday I asked this government how it was possible that there is no assistance for aerospace in the economic, economic update. I got lucky because the person who answered, the Minister of Finance, was the person who drafted the economic update. But unfortunately, she didn't seem to know what I was talking about. She answered me with remarks about regional airports and aluminum. I'm not saying that's not important, but that wasn't the topic of my question. I was asking a question on aerospace, the biggest manufacturing industry in Canada, with Montreal being the third biggest hub in the world. How is it possible to abandon aerospace to such an extent that she seems to have a, a forgotten its very existence? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, from the beginning of this pandemic, we have been there for workers and businesses in all industries and all parts of the country. People who have been experiencing difficulties because of the pandemic, and the aerospace industry is not an exception to that. We sent hundreds of millions of dollars to support the aerospace industry because it is a core industry for Montreal, Quebec, and all of Canada. We know that workers, manufacturers, and businesses of all sizes in aerospace and elsewhere are experiencing a difficult period, and that is why we are there to support them financially. The Honourable Member for saint saint bagot Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Deputy Prime Minister, today the Prime Minister. Well, I can't say that they're not consistent. It seems clear that there won't be an aerospace policy before we're vaccinated. There wasn't anything about aerospace in the throne speech or in the economic update. Canada was there to help the Ontario auto sector and the, the oil and gas sector, but it wasn't there for aerospace in Quebec. This is the only country in the world that doesn't have an aerospace policy. We're talking about the biggest industry in Montreal. Does this Prime Minister know that he represents a Montreal riding? The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as a government, we have always been proud of supporting the aerospace industry in Montreal, in Quebec, and throughout Canada, with record levels of investment, with supports for companies, and most importantly, with supports for workers, in training, assistance, and research which delivers economic growth in that sector. We recognize that the aerospace industry is going through a difficult period, like many industries throughout the country, and we will continue to stand up for the industry with the wage subsidy, with business assistance, and most importantly, by ensuring a strong recovery after this pandemic. The Honorable Member for mécantique lérable Mr. Speaker, the President of the Treasury Board was responsible for ensuring that a linguistic analysis of the wage charity contract was done. The Minister of Official Languages says that the Minister respected all the rules. Well, what do we see in reality? The contract was granted without any linguistic analysis to the detriment of Francophones. French, French is not taken serious at the Treasury Board. And 
the president of the Treasury Board is responsible for this fiasco. Will this prime minister demand that his minister do his work and fully shoulder his responsibilities? It's time to act. The right honorable prime minister. Mr. Speaker, as has been stated clearly multiple times, the nonpartisan public service recommended that structure and approach to support youth, and we will always be there to support youth, whether by eliminating uh, interest on Canada student loans, by increasing the youth job strategy, by supporting up to 120,000 openings in the Canada Summer Jobs Program. We will be there to help youth and support French throughout Canada. The Honourable Member, I will repeat the question. I'm asking the Prime Minister to reprimand the President of the Treasury Board. French is being neglected in government communications. It's a systemic problem. We have received COVID alerts only in English. Departmental Zoom meetings are in English. Linguistic analyses are being ignored. And what's worse in committee, the president of the Treasury Board blamed his public servants. No, it's his responsibility as a minister to make sure that the Official Languages Act is respected in this country. Mr. Speaker, will this prime minister reprimand the president of the Treasury Board? Yes or no? The right honorable prime minister. Mr. Speaker, we will not be preached to about the French language by the Conservative Party, which has constantly cut funds for language supports throughout the country, which prevented people from going before the courts and winning cases having to do with the defense of official languages, and the party that to this day refuses to, to support a measure to ensure that judges and justices are bilingual. The Liberal Party will always be there to defend French inside and outside Quebec because we know that that is essential for our country. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, Quebec Liberal MPs are refusing to stand up for French. The President of the Treasury Board is a Quebec uh, MP. But during the pandemic, he refused to apply the Official Languages Act. That caused health risks for Francophones and also caused the We Charity scandal. Why? Why is it that so few liberal members seem to be willing to stand up for the French for the French language. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Liberal Party will always defend the French language. That is why we have always worked to protect linguistic minorities outside Quebec. That is why we will always work to protect French in Quebec. And we will always only appoint bilingual justices to the Supreme Court. Unfortunately, I have given the leader of the opposition many opportunities to do so, but he has never committed to only appointing bilingual justices to the Supreme Court. Why? The Honourable Member for Markham Stouffville. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, when the first wave of this pandemic hit Canada, childcare providers from across the country were particularly hard hit. In many cases, this meant that mothers were forced to leave their jobs and stay home to take care of their children. And this is leading to what some are calling a she session. Can the Prime Minister tell us how the fall economic statement proposes to address this? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for Markham, St Markham Stouffville for her question and for her incredibly hard work. We recognize the extraordinary and disproportionate toll this pandemic has taken on women. Investing in accessible, high quality and affordable childcare is not only good for families, it makes economic sense. With the fall economic statement, we have laid the groundwork for a Canada-wide childcare system with a new federal secretariat on early learning and childcare. By taking this step, we are charting a clear and meaningful path forward to deliver this system for women and families across the country. The Honourable Member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Well, Mr. Speaker, public transit will be key to our economic recovery after COVID, but this government keeps saying no to York Region. The Young Subway extension would create 60,000 jobs, reduce gridlock, and deliver economic growth for the entire GTA. York Region has met all the federal government demands. The Ontario government has committed to invest. What is this government waiting for? Why won't they just say yes to the Young Subway extension? The Right Honourable Prime 
Minister. Mr. Speaker, this government has invested more money in public transit both uh, in the past five years and in future years than any government in Canada's history. We've continued to work with provinces, with municipalities on delivering on public transit, and we look forward to delivering on the public transit priorities of the Ontario government. Uh, we're waiting on uh, more clarity from them. We look forward to working with them on delivering for Canadians right across the country and right, Ontarians right across Ontario. The Honourable Member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. The Young Subway extension is York Region's top priority, but this government refuses to invest. The Young Line is at capacity, with 800,000 commuters a day and almost 100,000 of them passing through Finch. For jobs, economic recovery and growth, the GTA needs a union station of the north. York Region has delivered everything the government has asked for. No more excuses, no more delays. Will the government just say yes and get the Young Subway extension on track? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, on top of moving forward with historic investments in public transit and in infrastructure across the country over the past years and into the coming years, we've also committed to work in partnership with provincial governments. And we are waiting on the provincial government in Ontario to move forward with their plans on the York subway extension because we are there to be partners and invest, but we need to see the plan. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, York Region is one of the fastest growing parts of the country. Every day, 100,000 commuters pass through the Finch Station. I took the Young Line myself for five years as a commuter, Mr. Speaker. Extending the Young Subway Line will take cars off the road, shorten commute times so that people can get to their families in Vaughan, in Markham, in Newmarket. When is this government finally going to commit to funding the Young Line expansion. Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are there with hundreds of millions of dollars for infrastructure projects, public transit projects uh, in uh, the GTA and across the country. We simply need uh, the member opposite, the leader of the opposition, to give a nudge to his friends at Queen's Park to move forward with a plan that we can support and deliver for the people in, in uh, the York region. The Honourable Member for Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We all have seen the impact of COVID-19 on our economy and witnessed the toll this has taken on many small businesses across the country, including many in rural and remote communities. Through you, Mr. Speaker, could the Prime Minister provide more information on how the recent fall economic statement will support Canadian small businesses, the backbone of our economy? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for Cambridge for his question and all his hard work and advocacy on behalf of his constituents and indeed small businesses. We know businesses need support during this second wave. That's why we are raising the maximum wage subsidy rate back to 75%. We're also introducing the new Highly Affected Sectors credit, credit Availability Program for those hardest hit businesses. We're topping up the Regional Relief and Recovery Fund for businesses that are unable to access other supports. And we will ensure that Canada's small businesses continue to have the support they need as we fight the second wave and position ourselves uh, for a strong recovery. The Honourable Member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie. Mr. Speaker, in the face of the climate crisis, the Liberals have chosen to adopt the Conservative targets, and they can't even meet those. What's worse, they are actually having us backslide year after year, and they don't want these targets to be reviewed for 10 years. Their economic update is frankly feeble when it comes to the climate crisis. They keep talking about two billion trees, but they haven't planted a single tree. And what's worse, they've done, they've done nothing to create good jobs in renewable energies. What is the Liberals' green plan, really? Is it just about wasting $20 billion to buy an old pipeline and ignore LNG pollution? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canadians voted for a government that is determined to take action to protect the environment. We have accomplished a great deal over the last five years. We introduced a legislative measure on net zero. We have imposed a price on pollution throughout the country. We have invested in clean technology. We have banned plastics. 
we have protected 40% of our protected marine areas. There is still a lot left to do, but that is why we will be bringing forward an improved plan that will enable us to exceed the 2030 targets.